Hi everyone, in this lesson we're going to be talking about limits. And the first thing we're going to do is talk about the definition of a limit. So a limit, and this is the most important thing I'm going to say, so make sure you're listening. A limit is the intended height of a function at a value. A limit, always just think of it as the height of the function or the intended height of the function. So let's write that down. A function has a limit L as X approaches C, if and only if it has a left-hand and a right-hand limit and these limits are equal. So all that is saying is that if we're coming from the left or we're coming from the right, the height of the function is exactly the same. And we'll look at some examples now so I can show you what I mean. So example one is an example of when a limit exists. So suppose we wish to find the limit of the function, and here's my function, as x approaches zero. So we would write that formally as the limit as x approaches zero, and then we would write the function. So that's how you would read that, the limit of x approaching zero of 5x plus x squared over x. And so we want to examine the function coming from the left and coming from the right. So this is saying we're approaching zero from the left. So going from the left and looking at the function at x equals zero, we see we land right here. Now there's a hole there, but it doesn't matter. The intended height of the function at x equals zero is five. Now we have to also look at our function approaching x from the right. That's the notation approaching x from the right. So this time we're coming this way. And now what is the height of the function when we come from the right? The height of the function is five. Again, there's a hole there, doesn't matter. It's the intended height of the function and it's five. So since our function is approaching five from the left and from the right, the limit does exist and the limit as x approaches zero of this particular function is five. Now I have a note here. Even though the limit exists, f of zero is undefined. So in other words, if I put zero into this function, I would get an error because I would have zero in the denominator. So f of zero is undefined, even though in this case, the limit does exist. All right, example two is an example of when a limit does not exist. So we're gonna evaluate this function and I didn't even tell you what the function is. I just gave you a graph and I said, evaluate this function, evaluate the limit as x approaches zero. So we wanna look when x approaches zero from the left, we have an intended height of one. When x approaches zero from the right, we have an intended height of two. So these do not match. So since they don't match, the limit does not exist. Now I have another note. This does not necessarily mean that a point does not exist at x equals zero. F of zero on this graph is negative two. So if I put x into this function, I would get an output value of negative two. So the point does exist there, even though the limit doesn't exist. Now that was a lot, and that was a really core concept in calculus. Limits, derivatives, and integrals are what's known as the big three in calculus. So if you fell asleep a little bit during this explanation on this page, you need to go back and listen to it again before you continue on. So there are three approaches to finding a limit. There's the graphical approach, there's the numerical approach, and there's the analytical approach. So we're gonna look at the graphical approach first. For each graph, we're gonna evaluate the limit as x approaches two, and we're also gonna see what is the value of f of two. If I put two into the function, what output value for y do I get? So we'll do number one together, and then after that, I think you should try them on your own. Um, if we look at number one, the limit as x approaches two, so as we're coming in from the left, we land at a height, intended height of two. As we're coming in from the right, we also land at an intended height of two. 
So the limit as x approaches 2 of this function is 2. Now, if we put 2 into the function, if we were to say, well, what is the value of y when x is 2? You could see that there's a hole right there. And so it does not exist. Again, I would pause here. I would try to do 2 through 6 and then come back when you're ready. All right, if we look at this next graph coming in from the left to 2, the height of the function is 2. Coming in from the right, the height of the function is 4. So the limit as x approaches 2 of this function does not exist. If we were to look at when x is 2, what's the value of y? Well, here x is 2, what, what's the value of y? This is a filled in circle. So the value of y is 4. Number 3, as uh, x approaches 2 from the left, we get a height of 4. As x approaches 2 from the right, we get a height of 2. Those are different, so in this case, the limit does not exist. If we look at 2 and we see where do we have a filled in circle, what's the output? When we put x is 2 into the function, we get an output value of 3. So f of 2 is equal to 3. All right. Number 4, coming from the left, the height of the function is 4. Coming from the right, the height of the function is 4. They're the same, so the limit as x approaches 2 is 4. When x is equal to 2 on this graph, y is equal to 4. So f of 2 is equal to 4. For number 5, as x approaches 2 from the left, we get a height of 4. As x approaches 2 from the right, we get a height of 4. So the limit as x approaches 2 is 4. And if we look at x equals 2, we have a built-in circle right here. So the f of 2 is equal to 2. And the last one, as x approaches 2 from the left. Now, we're approaching positive infinity from the left. Positive infinity is not a number. A limit is a, a real number. It's, it's not going to be in infinity or negative infinity. Coming from the left, we have positive infinity. Coming from the right, we have positive infinity. Um, we could write positive infinity, but you have to make a note that that means it the limit does not exist. For f of 2, since we have a vertical asymptote, f of 2 also does not exist. All right, for letter B, evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 of the given function. And this is what we call a piecewise function, right? So there's different parts of this function. And, and what does this really mean? So this says that um, f of x is equal to 1, so in other words, y is equal to 1 everywhere on the graph except for when x is equal to 2. So that's the first part of this piecewise function. The second part says that when x is 2, y is 0. All right, so let's, you know, do some table values for this. We know that when x is 2, y is 0. And like I said, anywhere else on this graph, y is going to be 1, except when x is equal to 2. So maybe we'll just add a few more points. Um, if it's negative 2, we know y is 1. If it's 4, we know y is 1, and so on. Let's plot those points. So again, we said that this graph is equal to 0 when x equals 2. And everywhere else on this graph, the function is equal to 1. So that's the graph of our function. Now we can determine what the limit is. Right? As x approaches 2 from the left, we have a height of 1. As x approaches 2 from the right, we have a height of 1. So the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x is equal to 1. So those were examples of graphing. We can also take the numerical approach. We can construct a table of values and see what number we're approaching. Um, 
for x. So for this, for letter a, it says find the limit as x approaches negative 3 of this function. And we can see just by looking at this function that if you put negative 3 into it, you're going to get 0 in the denominator. But that doesn't mean there's not a limit there. That just means there's a hole. So we want to look at this close uh, at this function at numbers that are really, really close to negative 3. So th there's a couple of things we need to do when we look at the table of values. So open your calculator, and we're going to go to y equals, and you're going to enter the function. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go to table set. So we're going to go second window, brings us to table set. And we want to set our table to start at the number that we're looking at for our limit. In this case, it's going to be negative 3. And we want our table to look at numbers that are really, really close to negative 3. So I'm going to change my um, value here to 0 0.001. That's going to help me set my table up so that I can, again, examine numbers that are really close to negative 3. So we're going to go back to table now, second graph. And you see that I'm starting at negative 3, and we're looking at if we're coming from the left. So in other words, if I'm coming, approaching negative 3 from the left, it looks like I'm getting closer and closer to negative 6. And if I am approaching this negative 3 from the right, so I'm approaching negative 3 from the right, I am also approaching the number negative 6. So let's fill in our table. All right, so I've added table values that are really close to negative 3. And you can see as I'm coming in from the left, I'm getting closer and closer to negative 6. As I'm coming in from the right, I'm getting closer and closer to negative 6. So the answer here, the limit as x approaches negative 3, is negative 6. I would say try letter B on your own and come back when you're ready. First thing we're going to do is we're going to go back to y equals and we're going to enter in our function. Then we're going to go to table set, second window. We're looking as the limit approaches uh, x equal to 0, so we're going to make that a 0. And we're going to keep our table set to increments of 0 0.001. And now we're going to go to the table, second graph to get to the table. And we can see as we're coming from the left, we're getting closer to 2. As we're coming from the right, we're getting closer to 2. So our limit as x approaches 0 of this function is 2. All right, let's fill in those table values. So as we come from the left, we're getting closer to 2. As we come from the right, we're getting closer to 2. So the limit as x approaches 0 of this function is 2. Right, now the next way we can find a limit is what we call the analytic approach. That's when we use algebra or calculus to help us. And there are three different ways to do it analytically. We can use substitution, we can factor, or we can do what's called rationalizing. So the first method here I'm going to show you is the easiest one, one you always want to go with if you can. Just substitute the value you have for x into the function. And so in this case, um, the limit as x approaches 2 of 6 over x, so we would put 2 in for x, and we would get a value of 3. So the answer to letter i is 3. All right, if we put negative 2 in here, we're going to substitute negative 2. And when we solve that, we get negative 1 over negative 2, or we just get 1 half. Always want to do this method first. The problem is, you can't always do it because if you get a zero in the denominator, you have to come up with something else, but that's not the case here. Last one, we're going to put a zero in. The sign of zero is zero. So the last one, the answer is zero. Now the next method is factoring. So you factor the numerator and the denominator first. I mean, if we if we use substitution here, we're right away, we're going to have a problem. You see we're going to have a zero in the denominator, but we're going to factor and then we're going to see where we land after that. So we've got the limit as x approaches negative 3, and I'm going to factor the numerator. That gives me x plus 3, x minus 2. 
And what's nice is since I factored, I can cancel the x plus 3. So what am I left with? I'm left with the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x minus 2. And this just means there's a hole in the graph at negative 3. So I'm going to evaluate the limit with the canceled x plus 3 um, terms. And I'm going to end up with negative 3 minus 2, which gives me negative 5. Same problem we have with um, double i here. If I put 2 into the denominator, I get a 0. So I'm going to have to factor first. So the x minus 2 terms can cancel. So now we just have the limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 3. And now we can use substitution. And we get negative 1. And this last guy, again, if I put 3 into the denominator, I'll get 0. So I'm going to have to factor first. x minus 3 will cancel. So I end up with the limit as x approaches 3 of 2x plus 1. And now I can use substitution. Final answer would be 7. Some limits cannot be evaluated directly by substitution and no factors immediately cancel. In these situations, there's another algebraic technique called rationalization. With rationalization, you multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate. A math conjugate is formed by changing the sign between two terms in a binomial. So I have some examples here. Here's the binomial and here's the conjugate. The binomial and the conjugate. And notice only this sign is changing, not what's under the radical. Right, and another binomial and the conjugate. So again, you can see that we can't use substitution. Otherwise, we certainly wouldn't be using any other method. If I put 5 into the denominator, I'll get a 0. So we need to continue with a different method. I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the numerator. So the conjugate is root x plus root 5. What you do in the numerator, you also have to do in the denominator. Right, so let's simplify that. So the new numerator is going to be, you're going to FOIL this. Right, so the first part of this, here's first for the FOIL. Root x times root x is just x. All right, the outer and inner will cancel because that's what conjugates do for us. The outer is... Um, root 5 times root x, and the inner is negative root 5 times root x, so the middle terms go away. And then the last is going to be negative root 5 times positive root 5. That's going to give me minus 5. So the numerator really became a lot nicer to look at, a little bit easier, but the denominator now is, is a little tricky. So we have x minus 5, we still have this part, times this part. And I would say do not FOIL the denominator because you're going to see why in a second. And what happens is the x minus 5s can cancel. All right, so what are we left with? And you're just going to have to trust me. This process does work. We end up with 1 over root x plus root 5. And now I can use substitution because if I put 5 into this reduced, into this simplified function, I don't have 0 in the denominator. So when I use substitution, I end up with 1 over root 5 plus root 5. Or to write that a little bit nicer, you would say 1 over 2 root 5. Right, now, there was a lot in this problem. You may want to watch that again and just um, take your time and just make sure you're comfortable with it. Double I here, you can see again that I have 
If I put zero in, I'm going to get zero in the denominator. So I can't use substitution. In this case, I'm going to use rationalization and I'm going to multiply by the conjugate in the numerator and the denominator. So the conjugate here is root x plus one plus one. What I do in the numerator, I also have to do in the denominator. All right, so let's FOIL the top. So we have first root x plus one times root x plus one gives me just x plus one. When we are multiplying by the conjugate, the inner and outer terms cancel each other. We end up with an outer of root x plus one and an inner of negative root x plus one. So the middle terms go away. And then last, we have negative one times positive one. That gives me negative one. So the numerator looks a lot nicer. In the denominator, we have x times root x plus one plus one. All right, let's simplify what we have in the numerator. The numerator just becomes x because x plus one minus one is just x. Then the x's will cancel. And now we can use substitution because if I put zero in, I will not get zero in the denominator this time. So I end up with one over uh, one, root one plus one. Root one is just one, so I get one half. The last part that I have here is properties of limits. And this is really more common sense. This isn't something you're going to have to look up, and I'll show you an example of what I mean. Um, if you have a value of b, for example, and b is just, we're saying b and c are real numbers. If you have b here, you can just pull that out front, deal with the limit, and then multiply b by the limit. If you have two functions where you're you are subtracting or adding those functions, you can find the limit of this part and then the limit of this part and add them together. If you're multiplying two functions, you can find the limit of the f function and then multiply it by the limit of the g function. For a quotient, if you have, if you're dividing, you could just find the limit of this function and then divide it by the limit of this function. What we're saying here is you don't have to do the complex one, you can break these apart. If you have um, raised to a power, you could just find the limit of this part and raise it to a power. So we have an example of where we're finding the limit as x approaches 2 of this function. And so we're going to apply this sum property of limits, which means instead of just evaluating this limit, and that would be really easy to do, by the way. I could put a 2 in here, and I could figure out very quickly that um, the, the limit of this function is 19. But maybe it's a little bit harder of a function. You could break it apart. You could make this its own limit and this part its own limit and evaluate them separately and you'd get the same answer. So this is why I'm saying it's not something really that you have to worry about, but I just wanted you to see that this is a property that you can use. It's another tool in the toolbox for solving limits. All right, everybody, that's everything I have for this lesson. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day.